Hello, friends. Welcome to our Thursday night hangout here. I am the foe, Cody Defoe. This is Making an Impact. Joining me again this week, back from a one week hiatus, the natural Astro Pizarro. How are you today, Astro? We're feeling out of the last week. <laughs> no, I I had a lot going on at work, and it was definitely um, tough to get out of time to do the show. So I do apologize for not being here. I definitely felt weird missing it and being in the comments for a little while, but I definitely had to get my sleep. <laughs> How are you? It was okay, Ed and I managed to make do. We managed to make the show a couple hours instead of our regular one-hour hangout here. <laughs> uh, I am struggling today. It's been a, a rough couple weeks, and I'm coming down with something, but I'm battling through here to talk some impact. I couldn't couldn't miss out on this as i'm going to unfortunately be away next week so i had to be here this week hello bobby welcome to the chat thanks for dropping in friend uh we got a lot of fun things on impact tonight to talk about here uh obviously the biggest news is the worst kept secret in wrestling um we will get to the arrival of trinity aka formerly known as uh naomi in wwe we're going to talk about a new number one contender for the X Division Championship, a match that was made over the past week for the Knockouts Championship. We already knew the, the future of the World Championship. Uh, lots lots of play coming out of here. Um, you want to kick us off, Astrid, and talk a little bit about what we had on BTI, as we always do with the, the start of the show? Yeah, uh, so for BTI, we had Jack uh, Price. I have to stop myself every time. It's not Jack Price. Jack Price <laughs> versus Laredo Kid. I was like, this is not great for me with the names. Um, I feel like this was just one of those, like, I'm glad it happened because it was an X Division uh, type of match. And you like to have those for BTI. is a great way to get people going and to remind them what really is something that makes impact really stand out. Uh, with their products so uh, this was not, nothing out of the ordinary uh, it was a good match for me at least um i love having laredo kid wrestling i feel like i i missed i don't know if i i, I, I probably i haven't seen him in a while i don't know if it was me i don't remember the last time i saw him at this point because i have a terrible memory as it is um uh, but it was nice to like see him in action and see him get this one as well yeah, I think you've missed the last couple times we've seen him, and uh, Ed and I had the conversation when he came back because he had the the big life threatening injury that they talked a little bit of on commentary tonight, and the the surgery, the near death experience he had, and battling back and recovering and getting back to to ring shape and getting back to action was a long journey for him. So it's it's nice seeing him back, seeing him getting his feet wet and getting back into it again. Um, I did want to point out on this, though, because Tom and Gia talked a little bit again about the journey he's been on. Mm -hmm. And there was the one spot where Jack Price had Laredo in a pin. And Laredo kicked out at two. And Tom's like, Laredo, he's still alive. <laughs> Phrasing Tom, maybe the wrong competitor to be talking <laughs> about that with at this moment. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, they also pointed out a lot about... Um, uh, uh, Jack being in the gut check and like he, I love how Tom says I approve of him compared to of the winner Jason Hodge um, and I like the little parts that they mentioned that made me laugh because they said that he's a father of five and Tom goes that's a little sleep and a lot of work I'm just like <laughs> I'm in a family of five kids thanks Tom <laughs> um, but no it was just funny here and those little tidbits here in commentary that we don't get usually in like in the main show but it's nice to see them between them They're like it's not banter but it just feels that way in, the, in a sense yeah. when you hear them just give a quick shout out here too this was the first match that we got to hear jade chung in her new official role as bti ring announcer uh applause for for jade she did great i didn't have any issue Ring announcing isn't something that we'd usually talk about on this show, but uh, I know both of us congratulated J Jade with the news and, and got recognized there. So um, just a, a quick shout out and much love to Jade and all the best in the future of the industry for her as well. Yeah. Love her. Um, jump onto the main show then, Astrid. Uh, we got a little bit of a recap of the Macklin and PCO stuff. Um, we did get a quick update and the, the the news confirmed that trinity is in fact here and coming on to the onto the stage into the ring to take a live mic later on in the night welcome barry nice to see you here again this week happy to have you <laughs> we jump right from the the recap though straight to the ring and this was weird this is very on the impact like it felt uh, not that it's a bad thing necessarily it was just a little jarring that we didn't get any entrances for brian myers moose yu yu amora or bupinder gujar everybody's already in the ring and it's just a cold start right into the match how did you feel about that opening 
I feel weird because I thought I had missed something and then I realized that I actually didn't. And it felt weird having everybody there. Everybody just like, hell. It almost, I don't know if I heard the bell ring, to be honest. I just felt like it was just going to the action right away. And I felt like I missed something. And I kind of clicked back a little bit and I realized that I hadn't. It's like, that felt very strange. I feel like it's something that, something it, sometimes it happens in NXT, but not very often. So I felt like it was strange seeing it in Impact, though. I was not used to that. Yeah, it was. It was very unusual. I think the bell rang almost as soon as the video got to the ring. From the opening recap video, they went to the ring right as I feel like it was Uemura was just getting into the ring and then immediately ding, 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 matches started. And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, decent match. Um, no real hiccups with any of any of the competitors. Um, felt like a strong showing from all four. The biggest takeaway I got from this is it feels like they're really trying to help groom Gujar to be somebody for the future while also maintaining Moose to be a very, very strong competitor right now. He's not taking, I mean, he took the L's to Joe Hendry in the digital media feud, but other than that, Moose hasn't really lost much recently. And both of these now, he's managed to finish with his his rolling spear as it is um, and win pretty clean. I had to go to Barry's comment. Oh, the crowd was actually absolutely dead for that badge a bit or no interest whatsoever. And it just, it, at the same time, it feels kind of random-ish in a way that, like, the match in itself. And that's how I, I felt seeing them in the ring. Um, I did like in the commentary when they're trying to give us a little bit more of, like, Myers and Moose have gone and stayed together since uh, the match at the last pay-per-view. So it's like a, they kind of built off something off of after that match. So I like having that, like, that they have a foundation for them. And the way they built them up on screen, too, just like, you know, these two are, like, the most professional wrestling gods together. Um, and I like, even though it's, like, a long name for them, at least, but it, it feels like it has a nice ring to it. Um, and I also like the part of, like, towards the beginning that Yuya is going, I think it was for, I think it was for an arm drag, if I'm not mistaken. And the way that Moose stops him, it just makes him look so much more powerful because they're about, like, almost the same height and almost the same kind of weight. And to see him, like, stopping the way he did and just keep going, and just, like, I like how in that moment you feel concentrated in watching them as this is happening and i feel like it was a good highlight of moose in that aspect there um yeah, they played that same spot actually in the uemura moose match two weeks ago as well oh and that's another i like how they highlighted it here because if you notice it was like it made they made you want to watch it they like they had a camera right there in that moment um but yeah and then the little moments of like like myers pushing you more to the apron the way he did it too and i was like yeah, but um, I had a feeling that Moose and Myers were going to win anyway because I, for now, I don't see you and Bupinder kind of needing that win in that aspect. So it didn't surprise me that Moose and Myers won it and to see how they move them forward after this. Yeah. It, um, the other thing that I took away too is like they talked about Moose and Myers with the most professional wrestling gods, as you said. I also liked how they flipped that, talked about Uomura and Gujar and how like they formed their bond based on the fact that they're both students of Tommy Dreamer. Um, the little kind of Easter egg, I guess, or the, the little nod that Tom gave there in the comment when he's like, yeah, they've both been under the learning tree of Tommy Dreamer, not to steal the IP of Brian Myers, of course, but um, <laughs> it, it was a fun little piece to, to use the terminology that Myers is associated with while also giving us a reason of why Uemura and Gujar would have kind of a bond or a friendship mm -hmm. forming there. Um, I love them both. I, I love Gujar. I love you more as, you know, I followed him from being a young lion all the way to his time arriving in Impact now. Um, I'd love to see growth from both of them coming out of this, mm -hmm. being able to be in there with such solid uh, veterans as Moose and Myers is always very advantageous for anyone in the, the ring industry. Um, the match itself, again, it, it it, you knew it was coming after the Uemura Moose match two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, just the way that played out, I thought maybe we'd get a Gujar and Myers match first, but instead they just went right to the tag match, which is fine. Um, not sure if this goes any further now, though. Moose is one mm -hmm. clean in both matches. I don't see a reason why you'd need to keep playing this out. Yeah, I mean, it seems like I don't see much of it going forward. I just don't know how they move forward from this at, at this point with the story, really. Yeah. Um. After the match, we jump backstage. We see Gia Miller walking through the, the hallways. She ends up going into a room, which we understand is somewhere that Macklin has been setting up, and he's having a conversation with Champagne Singh and the Indian Lion Shira. Gia 
interrupts and asks Macklin, like, why she chose these two to align with, the question we all had coming out of last week's show, to which Macklin gives a non-answer, basically saying it's, you know, it, tactical. He's He knew that the entire locker room was going to be after him, that he had a target on his back. He needed to align with someone, and this is who he chose. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Sure. Tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> if it's like a random person generator. We'll pick yeah. these two. <laughs> yeah. Let me just randomly choose from the people on the roster who may be willing to have my back. And okay, I guess these guys have been on BTI. Let me elevate them up the roster. <laughs> yeah, it didn't. It didn't really help. <laughs> nah. Um, not much more to talk about there. I guess uh, we do have a recap of last week's attack on Santino which fades directly into the new detective of authority, Dango, um, in deep deliberation at a wall chart of all of the different suspects and candidates with strings attaching everybody to everybody else. Um, and Joe Hendry shows up and is here to help. Um, Dango's talking about everything. He's, you know, basically Dango is pure chaos in this segment here. Uh, what I took away from it was him telling Joe that he's had 16 monster drinks in the last 36 hours. <laughs> um, and he's willing to bet the farm on it being Mike Tanay who attacked Santino, which where the hell did Mike Tanay come from? Where the hell did anybody come from? Did you see the people on the board? <laughs> I just, I had to pause this when it when was happening just to take a screenshot. I could look at it a little bit later, but seeing he had like breeze in the corner and they had like, um, I, uh, sheesh, um, Harry I know I saw and everything. The, the, I know I saw that they had there. Killer Kelly on there with a post it yeah. note saying, uh, yeah. admitted killer. Yeah, she was towards the bottom. Tomko was in like what, the opposite corner of Breeze. I saw Tanae too. Um, there was somebody else too that I recognized. I'm trying to think back of. Oh, there are so oh, many names and pictures. Oh, Tony Timo was on it towards the bottom, kind of near Kelly, Kelly, uh, Killer Kelly in that area. The penguin, as Barry says. Oh my gosh! And um, or as as Barry puts up here, can you imagine new viewers seeing Detective Dango for the first time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so the ones I wrote down were Breeze, Killer Kelly, Tony Timo, Tomko, a uh, Johnny Swinger that was more towards the top. I mean, he pointed at him before yeah. uh, the before everything happened when uh, before Joe left. And then Tanae was in there too. And Harry and Megan were like towards the top there somewhere too. And I was like. And down at the bottom, which Joe Hendry points out, was Trey Miguel, who he he points mm -hmm. out and says, you know, Trey has the motivation. He was mm -hmm. the first time Santino was attacked, Trey was there and had just been put in the triple threat match that he could have been very frustrated and mad. And so Joe Hendry takes off to go find Trey Miguel. Um Cute little bit in here where Dango basically tells Joe that he's his best friend and his soulmate and his, you know. His everything at this point. Uh, it was like it's these fun two that together. they got Joe in this. Uh, we didn't yeah. actually talk about it last week. Ed and I we kind of missed it. Uh, the fact that we had a segment in last week's show where Joe Hendry uh, was reported to have broken his nose in the match against Sheldon Jean the week prior. And so you can see it in this segment today, even that he's still got a black yeah. eye that he's recovering from. And Dango even mentions, like, did something happen to your nose? <laughs> yeah, these are together better than I thought it was going to be, to be honest. Like, I, you can, on paper, it was like, that seems fun. But, like, seeing it on screen was even better. So, yeah, that definitely, I feel like that was one of my favorite parts tonight. It's it's nice to see Joe still being involved while he's recovering from his nose, though. Uh, coming out of this, we go straight to the ring again, where we have the death machine, Sammy Callahan, making his long-awaited return to the ring using his own entrance and his own music. Um, makes his way down. Uh, there was a, a video released earlier in the week of Diener basically summoning Callahan to come to the ring to accept his challenge. Sammy comes down immediately. The music changes and the design make their entrance. Diener, Mike, and Hand comes down and tells Sammy the challenge isn't what he thinks. He's not going to be facing him tonight. It's going to be Sammy facing Khan. Of course, the ultimate Khan by Cody Diener. Um, you know, playing the swerve card here and, and swinging for the fences with with Sammy Callahan. Um, how did you feel about kind of the lead up and then the match itself, Astrid? I knew something was going to happen 
in here. I didn't know what though, because it's just one of those things like Diener's not just gonna go against Callahan just like that. So it's like when he says, Oh, he's gonna answer his challenge, it's like, yeah, I'm waiting for the, this kind of swerve in here somehow. Um it just made sense for them to have Con like attack Callahan from behind and do how it was and, and how it played out here. I was just thinking of like options in my head, but I'm like, there's so many things that could happen just to make the match itself not happen. So I couldn't think of I couldn't pick one. But I'm um, like, this is one that makes sense for the group in itself. It makes sense for Dean. It makes sense for Con and for like design as a whole. Um, so it's something that I wasn't surprised of it happening. Um, like the attack before the match. And we also get like Angels having a distraction during the match and Dean are getting in there too. But I love that even with the three on one situation, we still had Callahan come in here and, you know, he took his moment. He did the low blow and he still, you know, gets away with everything, even with when he's unnumbered at first until he gets attacked by as they say, the sea of yellow hoodies or whatever they call it. Yeah, the, what was it? The, the sea of it. violence or the, yeah, the yeah, clan see, of no. violence or whatever. Army the of violence is what yeah, I got. Yeah, yeah, oh my goodness. I cannot wait um, the name. As we're alluding to, we had the return of the yellow hoods tonight. It's been a while. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, this dates all the way back to when Eric Young was still running the group. Um, mm -hmm. Yellow hoods. Sammy and Diener have a showdown. Sammy's trying to call Diener in to face him. Diener instead motions to the crowd, and we have a flood of probably a good 20 to 30 yellow hooded individuals uh, come down, beat down Sammy Callahan, and then leave him in the ring. This feud is not done. This feud is probably going to drag out for another month or two at this point. <laughs> um. I really hope for both their sakes that this story leads to bigger, better things for both men involved. Um, obviously, Angels and Khan have, have had their opportunity at ABC uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, I believe, um, that they lost it because of Sammy's interference. Um, I just, Callahan is too good, and Diener has showed such a strong range of facial expressions and character expression at this point that I really want to see him continue to climb and I want to see Sammy still at the top and I hope this doesn't result in one of the two of them being knocked backwards. Yeah, because I keep thinking of like the possibilities even after this is over and I just keep thinking, I just hope it's, I don't want to say bad enough, but I just, the planning in itself doesn't disband the design because I feel like they can move forward after this and do something else against somebody else. And then Callahan can take his moment to get highlighted and do something different from this because it's been long enough against the design at this point. But I just hope it doesn't lead to being Callahan this way and the design disbanding on this side of it. That's that's my hope more than anything because I feel like the design has, they can move forward, they can do so many other things, but I just hope they don't break them up after this is over. I want to ask at this point, because it's been going on for quite some time that we've been dragging out this whole Callahan versus the design story. If we were at an end of the year awards point right now, would you have Diener versus Callahan anywhere near your top of the feud of the year bracket? That's a tough one. <laughs> I feel like no, because I feel like at this point it has dragged down for so long. Like it, like kind of. I don't want to say it lost its meaning, but it doesn't feel the same anymore. Um, Does it have the like... potential to get there with the way it finishes? Maybe depends how it finishes. <laughs> <laughs> so right now I'm like I'm I'm I'll like torn about that question to the chat too for those of you who who've watched mm -hmm. and followed for the entirety of it. Do you think this feud has the possibility mm -hmm. to write itself by the end to be in consideration as a feud of the year? Yeah. While while you stew on that, I think we can move ahead, Astrid. We'll move <laughs> ahead or move back. Uh, I'm not sure which way we want to look at it. We're jumping back into Detective Dango's mm. interrogation room now <laughs> as Joe Hendry has produced Trey Miguel into the room. Um, basically, Dango is questioning Trey on his motivations and Trey flips the script back on him um, saying, you know, if anybody had motivation to, to attack and Santino, it's you because now you get to be the dictator of authority. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I love the part of like I forgot who started it, but they were still looking at his hair because of the locker hair that was found on the scene. It's like let go of my hair. It's like trying to look for anything. It's just I cannot with these three together. Oh, yeah, because you know, Henry inspects him for the missing hair, yeah. and then when he couldn't find any and determines that his head's clean, Joe Henry makes the comment. He's like, um, 
he suggests, you know, there's nothing missing here unless it's missing from somewhere else on his body, <laughs> which tells me that Joe Hendry must have listened to Oled last week because Oled made the comment that that didn't look like hair off the top of somebody's head. That looked like hair from another part of the body. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I would say that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And I love how Trey then again, without missing a beat, he's like, you guys think I fought him bare naked or butt naked? And Dango's just like, that's how I would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I love this part. Like, definitely like these two parts together. I, I love every bit of it. It was even, better than I thought Even Trey, be. like Henry and Dango yeah. are just perfect together. But even Trey just worked so well. Even <laughs> as evil Trey as he's been for a little while yeah. now. Um, Trey Miguel just has this uncanny ability to flip any kind of conversation like this mm -hmm. and just roll with it. Yeah, very well done. Uh, we got another segment then with Nick Aldis and Jimmy Jacobs, Astrid. Um, I, I kicked it to you last time we had the conversation about Nick mm -hmm. and Jimmy in their interview. I'll uh, ask you again, how did you feel about this one with Nick Aldis back there? I feel like I, I like this part of uh, more than anything because it's just his way of like inserting himself into the roster more than anything being I was here before and here I'm going to do it again. Um, and I liked having Kenny interrupt him as well because like we've been saying how Kenny really doesn't have any direction right now. And this is what they're going for for the moment while you know we have Macklin with PCO. I think it's super interesting and a great way to highlight Kenny King in here with somebody like Nick Aldis who just arrived there. Um, I love the part of he's like, oh, like you with your square jaw and your accent and your suit, like you probably got Scott the more like wrapped around you, but not with me. Um, and then he like the, the part that I had to write it down when he said he's like, it's like the monarch. You understand that, don't you? And he's like, God save the king. And I love I love that how the way he said it as he was leaving, and like the way he said it, that kind of swagger to it. Plus, being that it goes with his name, it was perfectly done. Like the way he just ended it. I I assume it was an intentional nod. I don't know if you know, but the coronation of King Charles is next weekend. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so this just feels like it was an intentional nod to the Brit that the king is being like mm -hmm. sworn in next week. Yeah. Um, I, I had a couple points from here that I really enjoyed. So like the interview started out with Jimmy asking Nick Aldis, you know, you came in, you immediately had that a confrontation with Macklin, but now PCO is named as the next mm -hmm. contender for the title. So what does this mean for you? And and Nick's like, well, you know, I know there's been a lot of fanfare and excitement about me coming here, but I never expected to walk back into mm -hmm. a title shot. I expected I'd have to come back and climb my way to the top. Obviously, that's when Kenny interrupted and went through all of what mm -hmm. you said. But I like how Nick Aldis basically acknowledges the fact of Kenny King trying to stand as a, a gatekeeper here. And he's like, you know, you want to be gatekeeper? I'm here knocking mm -hmm. on your gate open up and let's go and kenny's mm -hmm. like nah just like that title you got to climb up you got to work your way up to the king mm -hmm. yeah i love look at the way that barry says it to kenny king is still the person they insert into a random story uh, that's how it feels for me at this point too and it just i don't want to say it's upsetting but it's kind of like disappointing in that aspect of it because like i said it's like out of all the people and on and on more he's the one that was always kind of in the background there so you kind of always forget that he was there and, uh, and most of the time and to see him he, now he just, he's starting to and, really feel like that gatekeeper to me that anybody yeah. knew they have come in anybody that needs a name value to have a feud with to just kind of get their foot in the door kenny king's the guy and you know if you have somebody needs backup like eddie edwards kenny king's the guy you have some an open spot in a five-man tag match like bully ray <laughs> kenny king's the guy you know he's he's that veteran hand who's been around who's done so much who you know you can trust to have the ability to go with anybody in the ring at any time. It's unfortunate he can't get his own story, but maybe his story just is. is he's the guy, he can't quite get to the top of the ladder, but he's always that second rung that's going to be there waiting if you try and climb too fast. Yeah, I just keep thinking back of like that promo that he had in, at the beginning of the year of like him going like, oh, all the champions, make sure you're like, you, you know, there's a target on your back and you never know when I'm going to come. And then I feel like not much came out of that. And I keep thinking back of that promo and I was like, I just, I was just hoping he would pick a time and just 
you know, get himself in there, keep going from there and have like more of a long term story. But it was very short lived. Yeah, I, I do hope that this ultimately um, leads to more for him. Uh, and obviously we got an announcement later that the, the Kenny King Sheldon Jean connection obviously isn't forgotten yet. Um, although we didn't really get any more build to it tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jody Threat and Alicia Edwards, Astrid. I know you were looking forward to this one. Hello, Mr. Parrish. Um, this one, the only thing, <laughs> there was a part that had really frustrated me, it took away from me for the whole match. When Alicia starts wrapping her legs around Jody. And here I am thinking, oh, she's gonna do something great, and then she just moves around and just thumps her head on the like on the canvas the way she does, and I hate that move first because I I used to like play the video game with my brother, and that was the one move all the divas would do, and like not only that but like having like somebody like Jody just put her hands on the mat and just keep going like that, it does not work for me. I hated that so much, <laughs> and it's just like I wish I could have just said like this was what the only knockout match that we have for tonight and i kept thinking oh it's gonna be great because jody's in it and then i saw that and i was like no that's not what i wanted and i feel like it took away from everything that happened during that match because i hated that move i just hoping it was like the way she was setting it up i was thinking something great's gonna happen here i was very disappointed uh but over like on jody's aspect i feel like she did very well and like I w- i've been saying since she started and uh, she's racking up wins so they're building her off to a great start with a great foundation to hopefully lead her something bigger and better but i love having her like win little by little and like little things like this but yeah this part about like alicia i was like that ain't for me i don't like that move i hate yeah. it yeah with with the fact they didn't really give this more than just a, a one-off yeah. build um hopefully this is just that it's you know jody getting a win over an established name solidifying herself as yeah. someone to be reckoned with and just moving on to bigger and better things the match itself, I thought, was very underwhelming. I didn't, other than, the, like, the only good thing I saw from Lish in this match was the slap right off the bat. Yeah. That was a pretty solid slap to the face of Jody that she landed there, and that was it. That was where Lish's good <laughs> ended. One hit right off the bat, and she was done for the match. Um, no, Jody, Jody is, you know, a solid, a solid talent, a great signing for Impact. I just, I want to see her and what she can do with more established and more capable talents. That's what you're saying. It's terrible. All the women to use to show off the women's division to new viewers is uh, useless. Alicia Edwards. I don't want to say she's useless, but it just like it. I wouldn't have put her in there. And it's just like not only that, but I feel like her as a heel, like it doesn't fit her because we see her as always this like bubbly person. She's always blowing kisses to the camera, like her energy. It just it just screams baby face to me, no matter what she does. So it's like. I feel like she's gonna have to try a little bit harder for me to to have her like have me think of her as a heel moving forward. Yeah, it's it's been a weird transition for sure. That trying to tell us she's heel now just because she helped her husband. I don't, I don't know what ha- helping your husband has to do with making you a bad person. <laughs> uh, oh, Gia Miller gave us a, another backstage segment, backstage interview this time with Chris Saban and Alex Shelley. Uh, discussing you know the the motor city machine guns losing their titles losing their rematch to ace and bay um and then she brings up that you know it's not all bad though because saban managed to pin trey in the six-man tag and set himself an x division title match at under siege um, Bobby, I, don't welcome. I don't know hey, Harris, <laughs> i know I, I missed you but welcome everybody the part that made me laugh about this, the one Gia starts the, the interview, she goes, my favorite tag team. And I was like, say what, honey? What? <laughs> what did you say? And I was like, I hope her, her Ace Austin caught that part. Her favorite tag team is the Motor City Machine Guns. Get the heck out of here, girlfriend. I cannot with you in that answer. Um, I love that part of like having Savior like, highlight that he's going for the title. But at the same time, going, I actually goes, I'm going to go for the world title. And then we get a few minutes after the show ended that he's actually in a number one contenders match for the world title. <laughs> yeah. Very well you done. Know, Saban goes off talking about, you know, they'll always be a team, but, you know, we can both, that doesn't mean we can't have single success. So I'm going to go and become a nine-time, 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 nine-time X Division champion. Jeez. And Gia's like, well, what does that mean for you, Alex? He's like, well, I've been told that I'm the best wrestler who's never been world champion in Impact, so I'm going to go do that. 
Yeah, I think. Let me see if I got. Uh, Gia there was even go. confused. She's like, "What?" <laughs> Yeah, you're this gonna, was announced gonna, what? right after the show ended. And here we go. He's going for the world title. <laughs> <laughs> so it was for Rick Tammy. I was hoping they would put they would announce it that he was kind of like in a in a contender's match, something like that. Right after that happened, not after the show ended. Yeah. So the timing of it was amazing. But or sure. you know, at the end when they do the rundown of what's coming up, like yeah. have us, you know, by the way, this was just announced that this is gonna mm-hmm. be a number one contender's match at under siege. Nope. We're just going to announce it on Twitter. We announce everything on Twitter with Impact Wrestling. We don't mm-hmm. even save Trinity as a surprise. We make it official on Impact or on Twitter ahead of time. By the way, mm-hmm. Trinity's showing up tonight. Watch our show. <laughs> it got. They, I hope it got them viewers and a lot of memberships tonight, though. That's that's the important part. It's my hope. I don't know that I'd like to see Alex Shelley as a world champion, Barry. It would be it would be fun for him to get that opportunity with Kaz still lurking, having never won it himself. Macklin only just getting his title reign started. Um, uh, it's not the right time for Shelly. Maybe before he retires, but this isn't that time. Yeah. Um, we did get, speaking of Kazarian, we did get part two of that sit down here. Um, I didn't really take a ton of notes on this portion of the sit down. Um, he talked a little bit about, you know, being friends with the Bucks and going out with, Christopher Daniels and kind of to ROH and his time down there and then being friends with Cody and part of the whole start of AEW without mm-hmm. actually really mentioning AEW yeah. and then just, you know, <laughs> looking after himself and making that decision of when's time to yeah. care about you. Yeah. And so yeah, I, it wasn't what I was expecting for part two, I guess. How did you feel? Mm. I liked it because it showed a little bit of like we, what we didn't get before AEW started. Like you said, he says, oh, I, I was here and then I was seeing up with Daniels. And then when he mentions Ring of Honor, he does say the Briscoes, uh, Roddy. And then he mentions Jimmy Jacobs, like telling him he was, I guess, like a newer guy at that moment. And then he a little bit after that, he transitioned over and mentions the Young Bucks. But he, and then he says, oh, Cody. But I like the part of like he said, uh, this is the moment like. If you noticed, it was a nice timing because all of our contracts were expiring around the same time. And then my favorite part of this is that he said it was more than anything, either the status quo or betting on myself. And was it always like sticking to what I was doing or moving on to something new, which was AW at that time? So it's nice to see to get that kind of behind the scenes look at him and his mindset going into AEW because I feel like we get that from like the Bucks and we get that from Kenny, but we don't get we don't get that from somebody like Cass who's, who was there from the beginning and just left. And he didn't even get any kind of story to like wrap him up. He just left and then showed up in Impact not too long after. So we never really got coverage of him and his exit so it's nice to get a little bit of insight about it uh so i like this part of it and i think they said they have part three coming up next week yeah they did um just gonna throw this comment from barry there mm-hmm. because i think this is a great i know when uh, NXT went live for dynamite right off the bat there, mm-hmm. there was a lot of that first live episode of NXT. Hey, look at what we have. Look at our roster. And this this is a good thought with extra eyes coming to your program. They've been promoting all week that Trinity is arriving. Trinity can have live mic. What's he going to say? This is the perfect show to do, try and do this and be like, here's Florida City Machine Guns. Here's a sit down about Frankie Kazarian. Here's a backstage with Steve Macklin and a match so you can see Macklin in action. We're going to put Moose and Myers on the opener. We're going to put the women on the main event. We're going to put, you know, everything in places to, to succeed. Mm. Even the fun of like Dango and Henry making sure that you included and featured them on the show because mm. they are such a, a prominent part of the fun aspects of the show. Um, it just it, it's a fun time to be an Impact fan and I think they really did a good job today of trying to highlight that. Yeah, and I feel like even in commentary, they also gave a lot of background to like certain people knowing that they will get new people watching tonight because of Trinity. And one thing that I noticed even just in Twitter alone, a lot of people since they announced about Trinity people like, how do I watch it? How do I watch it? And a lot of people were, you know, postings like, you know, they have the membership and you, you, you have so many options to watch it. So there were a lot of people like actually wanting to watch it mostly because of her. 
but you know people were doing the research on how to actually get access to this so it it's important for them to like give us give them an introduction to the people that have may, might be potential new viewers that could stay after this though and then trade it is here going forward um so i think it's just a smart move of like introducing people in that way yeah absolutely um I just mentioned it here about having Macklin in action, but that's where we went to next was the mm -hmm. six person tag between Macklin, Champagne Singh and Shira taking on PCO and two partners of PCO's choosing. We get uh, the champion and his partners to the ring first and then PCO comes out, looks like he hasn't found any partners. He's ready to go at all on his own. And then as I kind of called it last week with Ed, Keith and Rhino, who have been feuding with Singh and Shira a little bit over the past couple of weeks, come out and basically tell PCO, we understand that you wanted to do this by yourself, but we got some heat with those two also, so we're going to come out and help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it was a fun way to do it, because you can't picture mm -hmm. PCO going around knocking on locker rooms and being like, yeah. you help me? <laughs> yeah that's definitely one thing that i was wondering how they were gonna introduce the partners because i don't see like you said i don't see pizza be, being that person of like asking people around if it was somebody like more like a dango then you would have seen him kind of asking people around backstage and making it like a funny thing out of it but with pco you don't get that so i was wondering how it was going to get introduced and it, i feel like this was a great way to do it, of like we know you don't need us. We know you might not want us, but you got us here anyway. Um, so I like uh, more than anything with this match too, is the storytelling of having Macklin kind of directing traffic. I like how he kept pointing at them. He's like, you go after him, you go after him. But he would not touch PCO up until like Singh and Shira were done. And just like PCO's like, well, you're the one standing there now. Um, and I like that part of it. Like he's avoiding him for the moment until he couldn't avoid him any longer. Um, and even the ending itself, I love having uh, Heath come in kind of helping PC on that moment just like here Joe go it's your turn now and he does a PCO song for the win there too yeah when he PCO has Singh confronted and he hits the wake up call and he's like okay he's yours yeah oh. <laughs> very <laughs> uh, clever putting in Shira and makes everyone else look better in comparison <laughs> Gosh. poor Shira yeah. yeah I wish I wish good things for the band, but he's he's been there long enough. I don't think there's much coming in that direction. Yeah. Um, we uh, this is where kind of the the knockouts division really took over the remainder of this show. I think, mm -hmm. other than the the one match that we still had left, the entire rest of this show is all featuring knockouts. And we didn't get any in-ring action, but we got a couple really solid backstage segments. And then we got the, the main, what everybody came to see tonight. Um, so we got started with the coven backstage. I figured before, I'll go to Parrish's comment real quick, yeah, too. Yeah, before I get to the coven, <laughs> let's, let's read Parrish's comment here. <laughs> <laughs> Two things they totally should have one, put one of the more charismatic ta talents to share this is how you watch Impact during a promo and PCO should beg someone for it to be hilarious. I think it would be kind of weird for him to like beg people to be their partner. That's the only thing that I don't see him doing. Oh no, he's he's not begging people to be their partner. The, they want PCO to Parrish, Parrish wants PCO to beg viewers to watch Impact. <laughs> Maybe. Oh Bobby, yeah, we have been enjoying Jody too. <laughs> <laughs> the Coven Astrid. I know we don't want to feature for too long on this, but apparently Taylor Wilde has been listening to our show because she's determined that the tarot cards aren't working, and now she's focusing on fire magic. She mm -hmm. has a candle. She's etching things into the candle. Mm -hmm. Kylan seems intrigued or concerned or confused about why we're using a candle now mm -hmm. and doesn't understand what it's going to do. So Taylor has to exposition to explain that when this candle mm -hmm. disappears, so will Jordan and Deanna. So is that when their contracts expire or? Oh, my word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thinking that too. It's like, uh, I want to say, okay, so does that mean Kylie and King does not know anything about like the witchy stuff and Taylor's kind of showing her the way about it? Because the way she looked at it, I was like, I think she would have known what that meant if, if she saw Taylor doing it. I thought that was kind of funny at first. Um, and like you said, I was like, I like that it wasn't just the tarot cards. I, I like that it was something different. The setup was different this time around. So it was like, good, a little bit of changes this time around. Um, 
And even then she was like, oh, I'm like, is it like black magic? And she's like, oh, it's black or white magic. It doesn't really have a color to it. So it's like, so she's teaching her the ways about this. I thought she would have known before she joined in with Taylor, but okay. Um, and when she said, it, I was like, oh, when the candle disappears, so will they? I was like, but what does that really mean? Are they going to stop the candle from disappearing? Because I, I, I want to know what's going to happen next. I'm curious about this part now, just which is Jordan weird. Grace I'm curious. Show up and just snuff the candle. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, now I'm curious about like this part of it with the girls and like the candle disappearing, whatever that means. Still curious who the third is going to be. Still curious how, you know, this all plays out. I thought a coven you had to all be, you know, capable witches. I didn't think you had a coven with one witch and one witch apprentice. I guess I really don't know anything about it. Is this like a Nicolas Cage film? We've got a magician's apprentice going on here or something? <laughs> I'm learning as I go through it with them. I don't know anything about it either, which doesn't help <laughs> you're learning i'm learning kylan's learning apparently ed's learning a lot he went and looked up what the tarot cards meant last week so yeah um over to some better black magic we have rosemary and jessica um trying to make their way into the undead realm um and summon father james mitchell to assist <sighs> It was so obvious going from one right to the other, just how drastically different these segments are produced and how mm -hmm. more capable Rosemary and Jessica are playing these roles over Kylan and Taylor. It's like you watch the cheap knockoff and then you watch the real thing. <laughs> and, and putting Father James Mitchell there just blows it even higher because that man is, you know, he sells everything to the nth degree at this point. Mm -hmm. Um... But he he even he in this segment says the coven don't have the power to block mm -hmm. your <laughs> Yep. Um it has to be someone much stronger than them. And his mm -hmm. access is still working fine. So he offers to take her to where she needs to go. Rosemary doesn't want to accept without knowing the terms of the deal. She's mm -hmm. hesitant. She wants him to tell her like what he's getting out of this. Why is he helping her? And he's like, I don't know right now. But if you make me wait, we, you don't have enough time to wait for me to make that decision. So mm -hmm. it's either come now or lose out on it. Papa Snugs. Um, another thing that I noticed too was like I, Jessica was kind of volunteering to go about it. And even she even looked at her and was like, no, just like you stay here. Like, I don't want you to get affected by this. And then she even wants to like volunteer to do it and. Rosemary's like no, we just uh, it's just like a like a me and Father James Mitchell kind of thing. You're just here, um, and it made me think of like when he did mention that there's somebody more powerful than the Coven. I was like, do we get Sue Young back? That's the person that makes sense to me. Yeah, I was like, I don't see anybody else that could fit into like this type of storyline that will make sense because obviously Ty is gone. So Sue Young's the only option for me right now. Yeah, uh, unless they, you know, maybe they have the hex still sitting in waiting. Yeah. You know, the fact they're still playing Father James Mitchell, he brought the hex in. Maybe they have, you know, Kylie Ray and, and Marty Bell still sitting somewhere just waiting for that opportunity. Yeah, I'm like, I, I love that part of, like you mentioned, it was like when they say, it's like, no, somebody more powerful than the coven. I was like, yes, okay. <laughs> Great. But like uh -huh. you said, you can tell, like, the, you can compare both segments and how it was more, like, intriguing with you know the death loss and father james mentioned than it was with the coven before that and that was just like a, a couple of seconds between each other uh i hope next week we just get a, a bunch of just clips backstage where we just see uh jessica sitting there with the hourglass just holding it and being like okay and then we cut to something come back to her she's still standing there just watching the hourglass <laughs> at this point you never know <laughs> Uh, we got our main event match uh, right after this segment, which was part four of the series of matches between Speedball Mike Bailey and the octopus Jonathan Gresham. What more can we say about these two at this point, Astrid? Uh, the only thing that I, I would say that's another thing that we mentioned a few minutes ago is that even before the match started, they gave you a lot of background into the match. Again, I get thinking new viewers, so we got to show them how we got into this match and what led to this. And I love how we, they had, as Gresham was making his entrance, they put the little clip on the side and while they're talking about it, 
you know, just like when Speedball is coming in, they have the other clip about it and then they show the bigger clip. So we get the whole background story before the match itself it starts. And, you know, these two, they always kill it. So I was not expecting anything different out of them. Um, you know, we have Gresham always focusing on a body part as he always does. And he was focusing on um, Speedball's left arm. The other thing that I felt like I didn't like, and I know it kind of makes sense, but the way it happened, it was awkward. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, Speedball was kicking uh, Gresham. And Gresham just kind of stumbled upon on the apron. But the way he did it, I didn't like it. I don't know if you noticed that. He kind of went through like the middle rope, but he was standing, going through the middle rope and stood in the apron like that. And I was like, I don't like the way that was really executed. I know he, like, he made it seem like it, because of the kick, but I just don't like how it looked on TV. Yeah, I, I think I missed that. I don't recall it. Yeah. That part, I, that's the only one part that I was like, I, I, I know he's like looking like, oh, I'm like wobbly at that moment. So he's like, he didn't do it fast or anything like that. But it just like the way of him going through the middle rope and then just, you know, turning around and standing on the apron like that. And then I think it's when people really kicked him again. And I was like, oh, I don't like the way he just set that up the way he did um uh, but other than that i feel like these two were doing great with the match in itself they have a great chemistry in there and i love having gresham coming in doing that submission the way he set it up i love that was beautifully done and then having people tap the way he did and i was like yeah it was beautiful loved it honestly these two are just they're two of the best in-ring technicians that i have seen in my lifetime they may not be like one and two necessarily because I have to give the respect to guys like Zack Sabre Jr. still being around, guys like Brian Danielson still being around. There's a lot of very, very talented technical wrestlers, but these two are probably the top tier that Impact has to offer. They can always put on a masterclass showing, an amazing match that anyone who has any appreciation for the talent and the technical ability that wrestling can possess these two act but like show it perfectly huh. johnny swinger wasn't around today but yes he is still around barry i mean he was on the board though but he was not yeah. still around <laughs> honestly I i've talked ad nauseum about how amazing this series of matches between speedball and gresham have been in the mm -hmm. ring what i want is for these two to be able to get back to talking and I know both of them, their expertise is their in-ring, their storytelling mm -hmm. in a match, their ability to wrestle without needing to talk. But in order for them to become champions and to grow and to get different places in the industry, they need to be able to fill out their cabinet to become more well-rounded, to show us that they can talk with the likes of a Macklin, with the likes of a Josh Alexander, to you know have some ability to cut segments with a Trey Miguel, with a D Dirty Dango, with a Joe Hendry. There's so many more places that both of these men could be. Speedball is easily a future world champion probably anywhere he goes. Jonathan Gresham is a former world champion that easily could end up getting back there in many, many places in this country and around the world. That I want them to get away from each other or at least start giving us more to this story because we got the six men, like we got the triple threat with them against Miguel. And then the very next night we open with a six man where we're like, why are they now teaming with the man they just fought against? Yeah. And why is he not around anymore now? Like mm. it, they're too talented to be just put in this position to just wrestle and don't tell us who you are. Yeah, I feel like it's something that stuck on me from when working with Ed. Ed always telling me, it's like, people like Gresham and Speedball, they're great wrestlers, but what are their characters? And when he asked me that, I was like, I can't really answer that. And it's like, I really can't. So it's like, it makes me think back of like, they really need to work on that aspect of, you know, their personas. Because all I can say is like, they're great wrestlers, but I don't have like, I can't say this is like their character and their identity going forward in the show in itself. So I think that's something they definitely need to move uh, and kind of build off on for their, both of them in that aspect. It's kind of the same place Cesaro got stuck in in WWE too, right? That um, yeah, everybody wanted to see him grow and become something more, but he was always just left as that guy who can put on a great match, but don't hand him a microphone. Yeah. Uh, after the match was done, obviously, uh, you kind of covered it that Gresham ended up getting the win by hooking on an octopus stretch, fitting for the octopus to win by an octopus. Uh, I don't know if this, this is done now. Ultimately, like it was the fourth match, but it's the third finish. Gresham now has the 2 1 lead in the series. 
are we done? Do we separate them? Do we go to a best of five? How are we looking at that? Hopefully we get a little bit more next week and into the future. Mm-hmm. We got kind of a brief backstage segment of Sammy Callahan um, talking to somebody off screen about needing him to have his back and to be there for him, saying that this person owes him one. And then it pans over and reveals he's talking to Rich Swan. They have a conversation about Sammy talking about Rich living with Papa Callahan at some point. So he hoes him for that. Sounds like Sammy has finally admitted he needs help to deal with the design. And he's going around trying to recruit. I know we've talked about it. I know I've seen a lot of talk about it online that everybody is hoping that this leads to Sammy bringing back OVE. Having this segment with Rich makes me think maybe not. Maybe we're just going to form a Team Impact to take on the design similar to the Team Impact taking on on No More. Hopefully not, but that's where I think we're leaning at this point. I just, in this aspect, I wish the last couple of months, aside from being, aside from having Callahan, that the designer would have picked on other people at the same time, if you think about it. So that way, when we build off the team, then we could say, oh, they picked on this person, this person, this person, like those are the potential partners for Callahan, if you think about it. Well, and they, I feel they like, did to a point, right? Because this rich stuff comes back to where... Yeah, but I feel like it just... Where, yeah, to eliminate rich. Yeah, but I feel like it kind of died. It just like, it wasn't something that was like, as, as this was going on with Callahan, it wasn't going on at the same time. Like it happened for a little bit and then it stopped and I feel like we're going back to it. Versus I was hoping this whole time, like as they're having the seven you know, chapters or stages with Callahan that they would kind of pick on other people as this was going on. So that way you could kind of pinpoint who would team up with Callahan. So I feel like at first I'm like thinking, who's going to team up with him? I have no idea. Like I'm trying to think of like people and I couldn't think of anybody. So when like he pans on his like swan, I was like, okay, I guess it just, I don't know. I felt like random at the same time. Cause like you say it, there was a, a point that it happened, but it stopped. So I never thought we would go back to that right now. And I don't know, just like I want to see how this goes moving forward because then who joins them too? I don't know right now. The only other one that really would make sense out of a story point would be Heath and Rhino. Because we go back to where Rhino was trying to convince Callahan that the design was a bad idea because they brainwashed him. So they're brainwashing Callahan. So he tried to come to Callahan's aid and Callahan ended up beating him too. So Sammy comes back around to Heath and Rhino and says, hey, I'm recruiting to take out the design. I know you guys have issues with the design. Join me and we'll defeat them together kind of thing. But then I'm like, that means that I'm guessing the solo within Sing and Shiro will be done. If any, if that happens, that's the part that I'm like, we'll probably get like multiple people doing stuff. Or do we um, go to a 5v5 again and somehow Sing and Shira help the design? That's the part that I'm like, I feel like it's a lot going on. So that's why I kind of was hoping that we have like little things with other people are moving forward. Um, and going to be here, he's come, and it's been such a waste. Rich Swan was a world champion, now number 10 on the PWI, uh, top 500, looking like a star. that he lost to Omega, done nothing of significance ever since. You can't have everybody at the top all at the same time, there. You have to kind of it's not that Rich is gonna like to look weak at any point in this run where he hasn't been at the top. He had his run with Josh Alexander where he got his title shot he had a long tag run with willie mack going back quite a ways he's been prominently featured and a regular on impact television for the last few years since his number 10 ranking and his world championship took forever for him to get that rematch for the championship as they discussed in the feud with josh but even after that he's still been prominently on the show as a regular every single week basically yeah that's true it's like i I, I understand of what Barry is trying to say of like he's been kind of like in the back burner if you think about it. But yeah, like you said, it's like we have that focus of like we have Josh going against somebody and I feel like kind of like that chapter's over. So he has to move on to somebody else. We can't have him and Swan going at it for too long either. And then if he if we have Josh as champion focusing on somebody, then we have to have Swan in something else. Um but I feel like it's just, there's a lot of shuffling going on at the moment if you think about it at the same time. So I feel like Maybe now with this, we'll see him featured on a weekly basis because the design gets featured very often. So I feel like that will help as well. Rich easily could have been an early feud for Macklin, but instead they focused on the Rich Swan and Macklin feud while Josh was still champion Mm -hmm. and never 
left it open for themselves. So you don't want to rehash and have Rich coming back for a title shot too quickly now because he already got beat down by Macklin on the lead up to Macklin being crowned champion. So you have to kind of keep Rich in a position where he can be relevant but not be in the feud. It's it's similar to Moose right now, right? You can't have Moose mm-hmm. versus Macklin. We've already had that feud last year for a little while. Both of them are heels. You're not going to go in that route. But you don't want to make Moose look weak either. You're he, Ultimately, right now, Moose is basically wrestling on the bottom of the card, but he's still being kept strong, and he's serving a purpose of tutoring and mentoring younger guys like a Gujar and like a Uemura at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give kind of a quick rundown of what they gave us for next week. Um, I guess the other piece that I almost skipped over here, we got a very quick backstage segment of Macklin yelling at Scott Demore about something that happened with Rhino in their match, uh, basically demanding that Scott Demore has to do something to make it right. And Scott's like, you know what? You're a big man. You can fight your own battles. Next week, you versus Rhino. Oh, yeah. And by the way, it's for your title. <laughs> yeah. I love the setup there and itself. It's just like, we we mentioned it says we knew that Macklin was going to be champion, that it was not going to be an easy ride for him with Scott Demore in there because of the relationship with Josh. And you can just see that reflected in here as well. Yeah. So we got that confirmed for next week. Rhino versus Macklin for the world title. We got confirmed uh, Frankie Kazarian. Part three of his sit down interview will be shown next week. Nick Aldis will take on Sheldon Jean. Masha Slamovich versus Killer Kelly. And the Coven versus Deanna and Jordan for the Knockouts tag titles. This is shaping up to be a pretty solid card. I think we get the return of all this in ring action. Masha versus Kelly is a match that we've been looking for forward to basically since both of them became full time members of the roster. And Rhino versus Macklin we've seen before, but it should still be a great match with both of those very talented guys in a title feud, most likely in in or near the top of the card, I would assume. And I'm thinking based on the dates and everything, we can probably see some other people in a one contenders match kind of getting involved towards the end of the match, perhaps, too. Possibly, yep. Um, I'm going to let you kind of lead us through the main event because the knockouts are your baby. Um, Naomi is somebody that I know you're very fond of or we're fond of, now known as Trinity. Trinity is in the impact zone. Astrid, how did you feel about her arrival and, and where this is headed? I I felt really just more than anything happy for her because I feel like now she feels like even she said it that it wasn't uh, from what I know from conversations with other people. It wasn't about the money. It was more about being in a in a place that had a great women's division that could get highlighted and that she could uplift more than anything. And I think this is impact will be the answer for her. Um, I love not only that, but seeing online the pictures of like Mercedes being in the crowd and supporting her just like as she supported her uh, in New Japan. So I think this was amazing to see um, seeing that online. I love when she started, she's like, let me reintroduce myself. I'm Trinity. And saying is like, I, I have been watching this, you know, uh, knockouts division for so long and people like Awesome Kong, she named and Gil Kim, uh, Mickey, Diana, Jordan. And I love how she said, I have won championships before, but I'm here to win more. And I love how even from the get-go, we're going towards, like, she's definitely going to go for that title sooner or later. Um, it's just, like, obviously something that, with the names involved, we knew Gianna was going to come out. And I love that moment of how she's like, well, you came at the right time because you're in the new age of the virtuosa. And, and I love how Trin didn't really hold back when it came to answering back to her because she told her, when you step into the ring with me, you're going to wish you were fired again. And the way that Diana reacted to that was just incredible. Um, and I love having Jordan come in not too long after that and just like, here, you were the, you, you know, you mentioned these names and we're going to come out here and want to answer you right here to introduce you to Impact Wrestling. And I love how Jordan came up and she's like, is it hot in here? Or is it that heat between you guys? And I love that, like how, like how she has that sarcasm going into this, and showing something a little bit different from what the girls are saying. Um, but yeah, and I love how even Trin said, "It's like you two deal with your thing because I know you have the match going on." But she said, "If whoever wins that title, whoever has that title after Under Siege, you're gonna be with me. You're gonna dance with me." Um, and I love how she even said, "It's like I'm, I came here and I'm, I'm here to shine and I'm here to glow." And um, I also wanted to shout out um, 
uh, Dean Williams was the one that used to do stuff for NXT backstage, did the the song for her too, and I think they sounded great. And I, the thing I, I I so enjoyed is like at the beginning I couldn't hear the song more a lot because you could hear the crowd just reacting to her so loudly. So it took me a, a couple of seconds for me to be able to hear the song, and I love seeing the people in the crowd being so happy for her. And it took her a while for for her to be able to say anything because people were so happy and just telling her like welcome back because it's been at this point almost a year since she was in action so it's just incredible to to see that reaction that she got not only during the show in itself but seen on twitter because i saw a lot of stuff on twitter when this was taped and even tonight seeing so many people being happy for her and just the reaction itself was so positive i'm just happy that she chose to be here in impact and it, I feel like it, like it happened with Mercedes in New Japan and Stardom. I feel like having Trinity in here is going to bring a new set of eyes to Impact Wrestling. That it, I feel is something very important. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with any of it. Um, it, it felt right. It felt good. I loved that she listed off all of the the women that have come before the Awesome Kongs, the Gail Kims, Mickey, and then obviously Deanna and Jordan. Um, I got a kick out of the the cheap kind of hits that her and Deanna took at each other with Deanna telling her, you know, when you get a match with me, you can't just walk out on it. And then mm-hmm. without missing a beat, Naomi kicks back, or Trinity, sorry, kicks back, you know, um, you know, when you're in the ring with me, you're going to wish you were fired. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have to give the shout out to Trinity because she gave us a shout out on there. <laughs> she put the entire knockouts division on notice because she came to make an impact. Which is what we are doing. <laughs> um, now you you hit on everything else that I wanted to talk about. Really, it's it's really nice to see her back. Um, hearing if you haven't already checking out the busted open interview that she did with Bully Ray, or at least the transcribed yeah. version of it, um, talking about her injury, the fact that she was wrestling hurt because she didn't want to be pulled from TV where she was before. She wanted to make sure she was still getting paid. She was still on screen. So when she she left there, she had to go and get the surgery to report, repair a torn labrum, and that's why it's taken her this long to come back. I want to pose you the question, though, Astrid, because the timing of it just leaves this in my head right now. Is the arrival and the signing of Trinity equal to the arrival and the signing of Nick Aldis, or is one bigger than the other? Oof. I feel like the only difference is that um, with her and the way that she came on, they're promoting her a lot more than they're promoting Nick coming into Impact and returning. And I feel like another thing is like they're capitalizing of people are wanting to see her because, like I said, she's been absent from the ring for nearly a year at this point. Um, Nick hasn't really been off TV or like off wrestling for that long, really. He's been doing like little indie shows here and there. Um, so it's like I feel like it's something that people were expecting. So I feel like her. I was no pun intended, I guess. Uh, you know, her debuting here definitely made more of a bigger impact than it did for Nick returning in itself. You know, they knew this, they knew the show was going to be taped. So even when they said it was a surprise because they tweeted about the surprise a few days beforehand, people already were doing the calculations. It's like, it has to be her. And I, I like how even the graphic they put it on right at that moment was like, hey, Trinity's going to have a live microphone. And the graphic in itself, they really like kept posting and talking about it. And they kept talking about her through the night. We kept getting glimpses of like the locker room that said Trinity on it too. So it's like they were telling us like we have her here. She's coming in to have her be. If you think about it, the main event of you know debut and and impact is incredible as it is. And even tonight they posted so many things about her. I feel like they're capitalizing more on her debut that they did on Nick Alves returning right now. I know it's been done a little while or a few times now for the last little while with the debuts and the arrivals and the surprises AEW loves to do it. WWE usually is a little more close to the hip with keeping things secretive. Um, From a TV standpoint, I understand promoting, especially Mm -hmm. for impact, trying to promote, Mm -hmm. get it out there, get people to watch your product, Mm -hmm. get people to tune in tonight to see what's happening, get people to, to subscribe to the YouTube, subscribe to the impact plus, you know, get on DAZN if you're outside of North America, all of those different options. From the live standpoint, because this news dropped last Thursday, Ed and I talked about it a little bit at the end of the show last week, the the rumors and the speculation that this was coming. Um, From a live standpoint, do you think the rumors leaking a day before the show in Chicago hurts her arrival? 
or do you think similar to how everybody knew when CM Punk was coming to AEW's Chicago mm-hmm. show, do you think that speculation and that rumor mill actually makes people even more excited to see it? I think it's a little bit of both because I, when they first announced this, I kept looking at the, the dates and I realized it was a Friday and I was kind of disappointed because I think tonight would have been a great way to make like a life impact show. And I know they, they p- tape it ahead of time, so it's complicated in that aspect. But I feel like tonight having the show being live, a lot more people would have tuned in because they weren't from what I saw, at least when this was taped, I saw a lot of people posting the video online already before the show started. So some people may not even tuned in thinking I already saw the clip on Twitter from somebody else. So I think like today would have been one of those good ones. You know, just saying, hey, we're having Trinity live on the microphone tonight, like really live on the show. And I feel like more people would have tuned in because only the people that were in there would have gone in live at the same time. So we didn't get a preview of it online in that aspect. But I feel like at the same time, even as I saw so many people saying, like I said earlier through the whole week, how do I watch Impact? How do how do I get on this? Because they heard that she was coming, like they're gonna be yeah. part of the show. And even tonight, I had people like in so many tweets that I seen, it's like, hey, these are the ways to watch Impact, and they put, you know, this is for USA, this is for Canada, international. And I love how people made it like readily available and they copy and pasted it online to make sure that people were able to watch this online. So I feel like even though we did see that part beforehand and people were showing the clips and everything from the promo, because I had seen a little bit of it, we probably still got a lot of people that were tuned in to watch it. And I'm glad they put her as the main event because it makes people want to stay in the show or tune in towards the end of the show to be able to watch this promo because it was the main event tonight. So I'm glad that she was like the end of the show in itself. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's just a thing of like today would have been a great one to have live. But at the same time, I can I would like to know if tomorrow they have how many people actually tuned in to this particular episode compared to before and how many people will subscribe, whether it was to YouTube like I have or to Impact Plus just to be able to watch her tonight, because I would like to see that comparison of the numbers before, because they will, like we said, show the impact that she's made of like advertising her beforehand. Yeah, I'm just pulling up quickly here. Um, the video of just her debut on YouTube already has just shy of 5,000 views in less than an hour. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, as far as impact stuff goes, that's pretty solid. Yeah, uh, you got to upload it quick when it comes to Trinity so that way you can get the people that are searching yeah. it up to actually get it readily available there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking forward to, to where it goes from here. It's it's an exciting time. You've got, you know, with her and the return of, of Tasha Steeles and a very, very strong knockouts division right now. There's, you know, a couple weak spots, a couple knocks on the division that we've mm-hmm. not necessarily been shy at, you know, admitting where, where there's some misses in, in the division. But as a whole, I think the impact knockouts division is as strong as it's ever been now. I feel like it's something that we have been mentioning from like since we started the show. We always said they have been losing more people more, more than they're gaining. And I feel like the people that were getting they didn't really advertise them well enough for me to be like, oh, I'm excited for this. So this is I feel like the first one they actually like really go above and beyond to really like advertise way before in social media. And this was such a smart move on their end to mention it the way they did. And I feel like now having people like Trinity here, I feel like it opens so many possibilities and you know the knockouts division that i feel like it, it's moving forward in a positive way and like we mentioned we know we have Kylie king right now we have jody threat and having trinity in here like they have some great additions so far it's just a matter of building them off now to the point of like making people care about them um more than anything i, I feel with trinity that's a little bit easier because people already care and they want to see more from her but like Jody, it's somebody like people are kind of getting introduced to her with impact. And so with Kylie King, if they don't watch her from like her indie matches. So I feel like it's just a matter of building them off and giving them, you know, people wanting to see them more often. But um, what I would like to see from impact moving forward will be having at least if you're going to have like tonight, you have Jody and Alicia was a short match. If you're going to have something short, then have a match that is a little bit longer to at least feature two knockouts matches through the night, at least. I know tonight we had a lot of focus to like the second kind of hour on the knockouts, whether it was backstage or like this promo in the ring and even the match in itself. But being that the match was so short, like I wanted more from the knockouts. So we'd like to see at least two like matches, at least on a weekly basis. Yeah, I know we've talked about it before, and I know I, I talked about it again with Ed last week that... um 
it seems when they do these tapings, because they tape two weeks of shows at the same Mm -hmm. time, their one downfall here is that they focus, one of the shows ends up being very missing in terms of uh, knockouts in ring action, Mm -hmm. but they compensate by being very story heavy, backstage heavy, you know, T- uh, segments in the the backstage area, whatever it may be, with the coven, the um, the death doll stuff. Uh, you've had the the in ring with Trinity and Deanna and Jordan tonight. Next week, now we get Masha versus Kelly, and we get the coven versus Deanna and Jordan. And I'm sure we'll probably get another short match in there, and we'll still get backstage stuff. It almost feels like, if anything, they could just try and shift their scheduling a little bit because they go one of the shows really heavy and one of the shows really light and just spread it out a little bit better yeah for sure um that that's our show for tonight that was that was impact uh hopefully everybody enjoyed it uh obviously we hope that this brings a few more eyes to the product that we have people starting to tune in to pay attention to understand what impact wrestling has been doing we talk very highly of it here at Making an Impact. We both love the product. We've loved the product for a while. They are they're selling out their venues consistently everywhere they're going. I know they're only selling smaller venues to fit what they can sell, but regardless, that, that doesn't change the fact that they know their audience, they know their crowd sizes, and they're picking the right buildings to sell out consistently. Hopefully they're on the right track. We're, you know, 20 plus years into impact at this point. We want to see them continue to grow and get better. Obviously, they've got a long ways to go to get to the top of the the mountain, but they don't need to. At this point, I consider Impact to be in the spot that ECW was back in the 90s. Yeah, really just a matter of like using those moments like tonight with uh, Trinity and taking advantage of them in that aspect and building off of that and keep going with that momentum they have because now they have a good momentum in their corner with Trinity's uh impact and debut tonight so if you just we have to keep moving forward from that yeah they got a big name in their corner they've got a big win under their belt that she chose them of everywhere she could have went to you know mercedes went to new japan i'm sure she had AEW knocking at her door she probably had roh there she probably had numerous other opportunities presented to her it wouldn't surprise me if she was presented an opportunity for the New Japan Strong Women's title that they're they're crowning in a, next month there at the, the Multiverse United show. Mm-hmm. So lots of lots of different places available to women's wrestling right now. And she chose impact. She recognized mm-hmm. what Gail Kim and Mickey James and the ladies of this division have done to make a name for themselves in this industry. And that speaks very, very highly for Scott Demore and Impact that they managed to pull that. Yeah, and another thing that I noticed, at least for her, we haven't gotten any details of like how long her contract is. So I just hope that they take advantage of like the time they have her in there, and hopefully that leads to them having her in a, I don't want to say long term as in like a year's contract, but at least like a year contract, um, moving forward. Mm-hmm. Because I'm knowing her, she's gonna want to do other projects now that she has the opportunity to do so because there's something that was limited back in WWE. So I feel like now she's gonna be like to me like. In that sense, with like the the way Mercedes is going to the point of like she's wrestling, but she's doing other stuff and taking the championship with her, whatever she was. And I feel like Trinity would do that same thing with Impact, and you know, uh, bring an Impact wherever she goes or whatever she does. Not moving forward, and that's very smart of him to do. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to bring Bobby's comment up before they before we close out. Who else would you like to see join the Knockouts Division right now? Anybody come, immediately come to mind? Yeah, shoot. It's just I feel like most of the girls that I've I've seen have gotten signed. Uh, well, I do have a, a team that I would like to see because I interviewed one of them not too long ago, and I they sparked my interest. It's definitely uh Raylin and Heather Monroe, a Blonde Force Trauma. I feel like now right now Impact does need more women's tag teams, and I feel like that's one that I would like to see. And I know um uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm saying it correctly, hopefully uh, Misa Kate and uh. Maddie, I know they're mostly in NWA, but for them to go in and jump in and do something impact, I think that would like that would be nice to see as well. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned earlier on the night, I'd love to see the Hex come back. I'd love to see them, you know, become mm-hmm. more prominent featured on the show as opposed to just the one-off taping that they were at. Um, 
nobody big name outside of of impact right now in terms of like former WWE or AW talents that I can think of. Um, I will give just the, sh- the shout out out there and the respect deserved because I think I would love to see Ava Lawless get a chance in an impact wrestling. If she wanted to leave the local scene and go to something bigger and, and get on a televised program, I would love that for her. I think Gigi will also be a great choice, but um, I feel like her and her partner, maybe that will be a good one being that we need more tag teams in there too. So, you yeah, know. you know, Gigi would be a great one too. There's there's plenty of uh, small indie talent out there that deserves to be featured. Uh, I even mentioned it with Taylor, aka Terra Rising, uh, when she was in the the start of the Alicia and Jody Threat stuff. That I'd like to see her get a, a more permanent role. Yeah, that's true. Um, I feel like it's a, a, a foregone conclusion and a given here, Astrid. Impact maker for the night. Uh, well, I'm definitely have to give it to her. It has to be Trinity. Nobody else. Yeah, there, there's nobody else you can on this show. It, it 100% is Trinity. She came in. She made her impact. She made her name. She put everybody on notice. She held her own in that ring with Jordan and Deanna. Let's, let's see it. Let's go for it. Um, you know, you don't need to put the belt on her, but let's pull that, pull that Band-Aid and just get her to the top of the card as quick as possible. Yeah, she said, let's dance. Let's make it happen and quickly, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's it for our show. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. For myself, you can find me on the Twitter, at Cody Defoe. This is my number one place to be contacted and reached. Um, I, I'm not anywhere else really very frequently. If you want to shoot me a message, respond, comment on anything, I pop up there. I always share when we're going live. Thursday nights here for Making an Impact. Mondays, you can catch the replay of this show. If you ever missed the live version or you want to go back and rewatch the discussion, uh, Mondays on Backbreaker Video. Unfortunately, next week, I had a change in schedule. I had a concert supposed to happen on the Wednesday that got bumped to the Thursday. Tickets are already bought. I'm not missing out on the concert, so I will not be here. Astrid is going to be bringing in a very special guest. I don't know if she wants to share it now or keep it a surprise for next week, but I will be back in two weeks' time to speak more impact with you guys. I, I won't mention it, just to get people to tune in to watch it. Um, I missed doing a show with him, so I figured this will be a great way to an opportunity to do that. Uh, Corey, thank you for stopping by. He said, hey, guys, hope your Thursday has been great. Just watch Trinity's debut on YouTube. Uh, great stuff. I'm looking forward to what she brings to the brand. A little late, but I'm sure you guys rocked it. Uh, no, we we're just talking about Trinity ourselves, and I hopefully that they upload her stuff more often so they can get more people watching this stuff on YouTube for impact. Um well, you, you have a recording for Marvel coming up this weekend. Come on, you got to oh, talk about too. it. Uh, wow. <laughs> my brain's fogged, okay? I'm trying to not deal with the sinus pressure right now and just not think about it. But yes, I will be here Sunday night with Oled and Andre talking Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Yes. Well, I, I think are you going live or recording it? I don't remember. Uh, I don't even know. But anyway, I would say and if you're still um, here in the comments, tell me what we're doing. I don't know if we're, we're recording or going live. Uh, no, if you follow our local establishments and you subscribe to the YouTube channel, ring the bell when they get when there's anything uploaded or anything going live. That'll be the best way to know about it or follow on their social media so you can know when they upload or when they go live with the Guardians review. I know it's this weekend, but I, I'm terrible with time frames, okay? Actually, um, Ed's, out, Ed's probably out watching the movie right now. That's why he's not answering me. No, he, he finished it, because oh, I okay. don't know. I'm going. <laughs> I, I got feedback, so that's why I'm debating about watching it. Um, no, but before we go, I did want to play one of the preview clips of my upcoming interview with Samira. Uh, it's going to be on my YouTube channel this weekend. I think hopefully Saturday before the pay-per-view. Um, so I just wanted to... Uh, let everybody know about it so i figured i'll give you the preview and then if you have it or if you're here right now you can subscribe to the channel ring the bell and click on the bell so you get notified when i do upload it it'll be sometime on saturday i'm trying to figure out the time but i'll give you a preview now of her time when she met randy orton actually did meet randy so that like was like a full circle moment for me like the person that i like love to watch so much like the my like the biggest reason so he was very nice. I, I had a sign at uh, a local, le- uh, I can't even talk, at a live, um, indep- not independent meet. I can't talk today for some reason. You know, I'm like the talker and I can't talk. Um, at a local WWE show around my area, I had like a sign, like, take a selfie with me. Like, I was so excited. I was like hoping he'd notice me. And he did. He came, uh, took a picture with me. I was like so excited. And like intermission started, you know, the selfie comes out a little blurry, but I don't care. Like, I was just, like, over the moon. I post it. All my friends are excited. 
show starts back up again and a security guard comes up to me he's like are you Samira and I'm like yeah and I'm just th- sitting here thinking am I about to get kicked out like how does a security guard know my name like what's happening here he goes you know Randy saw the picture online and it came out blurry he wants you to come back and take retakes and I was like what what and all the people around me are like what and I'm like of course, like, and I'm, and, like, my mom was sitting up, like, in, like, the hundreds or two hundreds or something, and I'm, like, on the phone with my mom as I walk back, I'm, like, mom, if you don't see me, I'm going to take a picture with Randy right backstage, and she was, like, what? <laughs> and, like, I go back, and I get to, like, meet him and talk with him for a little bit, and it was just, like, oh, my God, and he was, like, the nicest guy ever. I was, like, that literally probably, like, made my whole entire life at 15 years old, um, and he was just really nice. I'd love to meet him again one day i haven't like see like met him since then i would love to meet him again and like my dream is definitely to interview him since- yeah um i wanted to show that out because i i definitely talk with samir about like ring announcing and everything she's done in uh, wrestling media and what you know her advice would be for anybody that um might want to pursue that um barry saying i'm not watching back next week's eurovision song contest second semi-final night world's biggest music competition you can't leave me alone in here barry you owe me one though for that one but just so you know but yeah if you haven't yet i would subscribe to the youtube channel will be the best way to know when i upload the interview um i'm going to be rating if i do it correctly i hope um if i'm saying it correctly santi sap on twitch i know i like his tiktok content so i wanted to like rate him on twitch as, as we can tonight i was hoping he would be live for the time we were done so he is so i'm just gonna rate him over now but i really just want to thank everybody for being here tonight and joining us in this discussion for impact uh join me next week with a special guest as uh cody said he won't be here but you won't know when to you tune in so it's, just letting it's you know a, very nice to have everybody in the chat as always just throw throw everybody's name throw a shout out bobby berry uh bobby munson bobby Batito, ed uh parish Papa Smokes, Corey Michaels, everybody who joined us. We always appreciate you commenting, joining the conversation. It means a lot. We love hearing from you guys. We love talking impact with you guys. Hope to see you back here next time. That's it. See you next time.